Well, this is uh, very nice to meet you again. I have a very strong voice, so I can uh, really overpower, even if I am small, kind of. So I am a geographer. I am no economist. I have been working with economists since a long time now, with David especially. And I've been working on environmental mobilization since the 2000s, something like that. And I work on, on, um, on mobilization at the European scale. I've been working in Russia, Germany, Netherlands, UK, even the US. And I work on a very special kind of mobilization, meaning that I am not following Greenpeace or very big mobilization but what I call very ordinary mobilization, the one which are related to local actors, uh, civil society at a very small scale, uh, or sometimes at bigger scales, like uh, working on women mobilization in the Amazonia uh, uh, while they were fighting against a big dam, and they went also to uh, to, uh, how do you call that, United Nations. So, I mean, you can see all kind of interscalar relationship, but what is interesting is, well, my specific way of engaging with mobilization, I would say, what I call ordinary environmentalism. And I have just released a book on the topic uh, in French, uh, and I think that uh, uh, that interests me, especially because I work on gender issues uh, and the role of women uh, in spaces, different spaces. To give you an example why I'm interested in that, most uh, mobilization in the environmental field, and we will discuss more about that, uh, were mostly male in the 70s and 80s, when you think of Earth First, Greenpeace, or other mobilization, uh, while um, local mobilization, which were much more engaged with uh, justice issue, for example, uh, were uh, more composed of women. I mean, there is a, because they were local and women were defending quality of life at local scales. So that was why I uh, was uh, more interested in this kind of mobilization. So don't worry, uh, this is uh, the first slide. Part of it is in French, but the rest of the slideshow will be in English, so you won't have any trouble reading it. And I will send it to you nonetheless, so it doesn't matter. So you could wonder nowadays why do civil society and local mobilization do take care of these environmental issues on the territory. And I'm working right now in France especially, but I hope I will, and in New York too, in New York City. And I work to see how people do engage themselves in this local mobilization, defending different kind of issues. That can be energy issues, that can be gardening issues, that can be uh, anger issues, meaning that uh, people, uh, deprived people, do not have access to uh, food of quality, and so this mobilization do take care of these issues. Uh, and so you, ki you kind of find on different territories all kind of mobilizations. And we try to understand how do they act, what are the motivation for engagement, how do they organize themselves. For example, you, you can't find less organized and sci scientists trying to, uh, to mobilize on these issues. For example, the other day I was at a meeting about scientist rebellion and there were many scientists trying to engage on this uh, climate cause and they were not organized at all in terms of, you know, it, you need political culture in order to get organized, in order also to face, you know, uh, judicial issues. I mean, sometimes you try to occupy some place you don't want to be built and you have the law against you or you have the police against you. So you need to get organized for all these questions. So what are 
the action models you can you can say and one uh, i mean it's true that uh, this environmental this mobilization has been studied at least in the 19th century we will go back on that uh, they were not all environmental at the time. You can, uh, you can uh, see that in the 19th century, for example, the social issues were at the forefront, while now you could say that the environmental issues are at the forefront. Uh, but uh, it still is an ongoing issue how to uh, question this mobilization uh, and to find a better way to describe them on the field. So why do I think that it is important for you economists? It's because these two things, two arguments, I would say that a lot of this mobilization on different territories do engage in circular economy. For example, if you take some well-known uh, mobilization like Secours Populaire, Emmaüs, and that, now they uh, engage in environmental issues, in climate issues, and they work with small gardens and other people, you know, on the field, and trying to uh, network at the local scale in order to provide food for people, for example, in case of epidemics, of hunger, of deprivation and such. So you find a new way to engage with the territory and to find new way of uh, networking. So as a geographer, uh, this is important because most mobilization until now were mo uh, mostly analyzed through social movements, like you know, a, a, an issue of society, not an issue of territory, of of, uh, of, uh, of spaces. So I would say that nowadays with the environmental issues in terms of analysis, the geographical, what we call the world, spaces, places, territories, all scales, ocean, are uh, all kind of... Nowadays, uh, the, 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 the causes are mostly geographical. I mean, uh, we very much engage for geographical causes which is quite new if you compare it to the 19th century, where people were most engaged for salary issue, for, you know, social issue or socio-economic issue. So there is a change, a switch uh, in between the 19th century and even mid-20th uh, mid uh, until now. So, and when I talk of geography, I'm not only talking of the discipline as such, I'm talking about what we call geography as a common sense. So it's like the place of politics. And it is also the place and the topic of politics, you know. For, for example, if you think about it until, uh, until the 70s and even afterwards, I mean, most local actors like mayors or, you know, local actors, they were not forced to engage with the environmental issues. They were not responsible po for pollution. They were not responsible for the health of their constituents. I mean, and nowadays they have this kind of responsibility, which is not just to administer well the space they're elected from, but also to take care of very complex issues like pollution, for example. If you, I, I work with Ivry sur Seine, who was, uh, which was a communist uh, uh, city. It's just in the suburb of Paris, uh, and it was communist since uh, since always. I mean, since. 1896, so you can say that it is a long tradition, and they have been engaging with pollution because they have this, uh, uh, how do you call them, you know, which burns waste in order to provide for gas uh, warming people, I don't know how you call it, and it's very polluting, uh, but it is very complex for them uh, to understand what is uh, what is the issue, what is at stake. So they rely on mobilization, local mobilization, uh, to uh, provide them with expertise. So there is a new chain of actors in terms of expertise, uh, which is very important at the local scale, because otherwise 
these local actors would be deprived of expertise as such. It's the same for biodiversity issues, it's the same for climate issues, and you can see at the local scale, which is very important, and all these issues I am talking about are geographical as such. I mean, you can describe them as uh, being related to places in all their uh, thickness. So, uh, and this is what I call the three major issues, local, global, place, earth, environmental, and the scales of regulation. Yes? Uh, yes? This is not my computer, let's see. She told me it was tactile, so, I know, this was the best, the bad move. Okay. Uh, Rima? Well, I don't know how this computer works. Let me. You have PowerPoint down there. The orange peak. The orange peak, okay. So, yeah. And then bottom right. Oh, is that better? Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, so, as I told you, I think there is three major issues, three major issues in terms of politics, this relationship between local and global, uh, which is very important. For example, if you talk about uh, climate justice, and there are strong movements in terms of climate justice, environmental justice was made of local mobilization. A lot of mothers, I mean, there is a movement in the States which is called Mothers for the Environment, Mothers as uh, Mothers and Children. And uh, so environmental justice was very much made at a very local scale. And climate justice was very much north-south movements, you know. And nowadays, you could say that climate justice is landing somehow. And so this climate justice uh, from global are becoming local more and more. So there is such a move in terms of environmental mobilization. The environment is what I talk, uh, talk to you about, meaning like if you have to take into account the way uh, that uh, uh, emission of gas can be dangerous for the health. This is what I call the thickness of the environment, meaning that space is not just a blank space, it is a material space with all its ecological issues. And the scales of regulation mean that for example, if you have a local actor now, he has to take into account the IPCC, for example, uh, which is very much a local global issue. It's a new scale of regulation somehow, and it's very difficult for these local uh, players to take into account such expert issues. I mean, these are very complicated issues. If you get elected yourself someday, you will see how much it is difficult to tackle with issues such as biodiversity on one hand, uh, climate on the other hand, and I don't know, health issues on the third hand. I mean, these are very complex issues. So, oh, well, this is, this is a, a pun, a joke. <laughs> well, whatever. <laughs> uh. So uh, what you have to say, to see also this ordinary mobilization, all kinds of them. Some are very political and some are not. Some people do not trust uh, the word politics. Uh, they don't want to hear about that. They think it's always uh, partisan uh, politics. So even though they are protecting bees, mushrooms, lands, people, they do not want to be, uh, or even if they are for degrowth, for example, they do not want to be uh, named after whatever political uh, trend or, or, or... So, Especially, for example, I was an expert during the, the, the I was a researcher during the 
uh, National Citizen Climate Convention, which was in France, you remember, it was like uh, in 2020, 2019, 2020, there was 150 uh, citizens we, which were gathered, grouped together to deliberate about the climate future of France. Uh, and it was very interesting to see how citizens were engaging into this kind of policy making. And you could see afterwards, I interviewed many people, people, for example, uh, who were workers, very, very uh, simple people, you could say. And even though they were very much engaged in degrowth, uh, they say it's just a matter of common sense. It's not a matter of politics. I mean, I do not want to waste anything. It's not a matter of politics. It's just you can't waste anything. I have been raised as uh, someone who should not waste anything. So you see, it's like uh, there are all this uh, issue in uh, uh, ordinary uh, environmentalism. So also this mobilization, they are all around you. If you look at the number of people and uh, collectives uh, which have been registered as a mobilization at the national scale, there are more than two million of uh, associations nowadays, and a lot of them are, uh, invest uh, are investing in this field of uh, climate <coughs> environmental issues. So there is a raise of this number of mobilization at the local scale and the national scale, but also worldwide. And it is a very uh, significant move uh, uh, at uh, all levels. If I say at all levels, it's interesting as such, but also because it uh, signs the transformation of politics. I mean, nowadays, uh, you can see I work with the city of Paris, for example, nowadays for the adaptation to climate change. We, we, uh, we contributing to the plan, uh, to climate, uh, the climate plan, and they're asking how should we work with civil uh, mobilization? How should we work with them? They don't know very well how to work with them how to be more structured in terms of working with the civil society. Because you have to understand, and I, I have no time to discuss that, but there is a different political culture in each country. And each country, for example, Germany, France, UK, and each country has its own way of working with local mobilization. I mean, for some, like in France, people who are elected say, I am the representant of the people, so I should not work with mobilization. I mean, this is not what is politics about. And some other, like in Germany, say that's what I should do, because they're much more decentralized. So every time when you work with mobilization, it means like uh, with the work of guilds, you have to work as a niche, but also look at the landscape in terms of how this mobilization are funded, how much they are authorized to work, and how they can recruit at the local level. So, for example, if you take a small mobilization in France, I mean, they have a very small budget, for example, 7,000 euros per year, while you go at New York City, and some mobilization do take care of Central, Par Central Park. So they have a huge budget to do so. I mean, it's not at all the same way of uh, working. So, uh, I guess. Okay, this is just, you know, pictures of different mobilization, ex uh, in particular on, in gardens. Alors, uh, one thing you can say also, this mobilization are very transversal. I mean, they're working on all topics of ecological transition, as I told you, as much on waste, as much on air quality, sound quality, etc. And if they, like in Ivry or in other cities, if they're uh, well related and if the local actor is decided to make uh, of this link to mobilization, a collective stake, 
uh, you can find mobilization on air quality, working with mobilization on food, with working. So you can find at the local scale a new way to uh, network uh, this mobilization. Uh, that's what uh, when I uh, when I talk about concrete relationality, that's what I mean. I mean, for example, if you uh, the, a certain mobilization who, who has a contact with very poor people uh, for for clothes and for food, do act with a local garden, do act with, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, local people working on cycling and slow mobility. And so this is a very concrete relationality, new chain of, new chain of production of solidarity, you can say. Uh, and you can find someone like Michel Etty who has developed the idea of individualized collective action. Uh, this expression is interesting because uh, uh, if, you talk, if you talk of the analysis of collective mobilization in the 20th century, you would talk about collective mobilization. And uh, for, let me give you a concrete example. Uh, I have worked with mobilization uh, which were against this big uh, waste burner I was talking about. And mm. they, they were they're very much 20th century. Um, they qualified themselves as being uh, 20th century in their conception of collective action. And they were working with another mobilization which were cre was created by people of your age or a bit older. And so this new mobilization was working on how people could dispose of waste more eco-friendly. So this was much more individualized, the other mobilization, and much more addressing to individual gestures. So you, you find this, this idea of individualized collective action, which is a new way of uh, understanding what is at stake at, uh, at, this, uh, at this level. Uh, also, you know, uh, uh, Micheletti uh, talks about it is a practice of responsibility, how to feel engaged uh, at taking care of something, of seeking the common good as an ethical way of looking at the environment. It's not an issue of morality, you could say, anymore, of what's good and what's bad, but how me, myself, I am going to engage with the environment in a good way, meaning in a way that I find responsible, engaged, and such. Okay, uh, so I, 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 I told you I have worked with many mobilization, I have worked a lot with mobilization related to animals' life, in cities especially. I mean, uh, with cats, even with cockroaches, mushrooms, bees, and all kind of living beings in cities. You can find even mobilization about rats in the sewer. So, I mean, there are all kind. You, and there are, you, you, you can find that not serious, but some people do feel it's, you know, some, somehow related to their real life. I mean, for example, if I take the mobilization related to cats, it was mostly women at the time I investigated it. And they said, when I was uh, interrogating them, they say, well, we leave the big animals to men, you know, elephants, and we take the cats. So, I mean, it, you can say that it is a gender issue as such. I mean, uh, it's like... Uh, also, because people feel lonely and they need to engage. I mean, that's something very important, uh, especially in cities. Uh, so, and some people do uh, consider this collective mobilization as hybrid community. Uh, a community which includes not only people, human beings, but also all kinds of beings and entities, meaning that you work with 
waste and you can say that waste is part of your way of seeing yourself in the world, of engaging with this world. So you can't say that waste has no action upon you, it has, it acts. If waste is more present than not, you will find that it has some effect on your behavior. So you can say it's a hybrid community and you live together, you share meaning, interest, and that's what, uh, that's what these philosophers uh, call a cultural ecosystem. I mean, it's not only about, you know, materiality, it's also about meanings, symbols, and such. For example, when the women say, well, we leave the big animals to, to, to men, it means it's a symbolic issue, uh, as well as a material one. Okay, we'll see that afterwards, it's just images. Uh, also, when you talk about ordinary environmentalism, it means that there are such issues on territories. I mean, we talk of special species that we should protect, such as the elephant, hippopotamus, but we could also talk about all these ordinary species that populate our territories. I mean, they're all around us. Uh, uh, even in cities, for example, in cities you can find all spaces you don't see. Uh, the first investigation I did in the 90s, people didn't think there were any animals in cities except in zoos and, uh, and in flats, in domestic uh, spaces. But in fact, there are plenty of them, microorganisms at all levels, especially in undergrounds. Right now, I can't tell you the number because uh, I don't have the memory of them, but uh, you can find more underground spaces than uh, above ground spaces. These underground spaci spaces we have created, such as uh, parking lots, such as all kinds. In terms of meter squares, there are more of them than above ground spaces right now you know, and there are plenty of species who are living in these underground spaces. Not only rats, I mean, plenty of arthropods, small insects, small microorganisms. There is all the life evoluting in, in these new species, in, in, in these new spaces. I have to articulate better. <laughs> so, Okay, and if you refer to anarchist thinkers, you can think that this ordinary environmentalism is very much what the uh, anarchist thinkers, like, such as Proudhon, Kropotkin, Kropotkin was a geographer. Remember that a lot of anarchists were geographers at the first, Reclus, Elysée Reclus was such. And uh, uh, that's what they called what is not captured by the capital. I mean, what is being invisible, invisible, invisible? <laughs> much, much easier in French, I would find. <laughs> but it's translated here, so you can uh, see it. Uh, and uh, it's also because it's often the product of the activity of women. I mean, it's like something which is not accounted for. So it's uh, interesting to see how it relates to that. So if we go back very quick, how long do I have more? And I want to discuss with you also of different things. Uh, Four. What? Yeah, but we need more time to discuss. It's, uh, let's, uh, yeah, 3.30 or three, a, quarter, uh, a quarter after three. Let's say something like that. So, okay, in the 19th century, there are many books about that. So you can refer to that. And it's interesting if you look at this mobilization and how they uh, do especially nowadays where you can find a lot of governments very inactive in the field of environment, uh, they do play a major role in terms of 
making society evolve. I mean, it's like, uh, it's not only, uh, it's not only how big they are, it's also because they bring other issues on the table. For example, the gender issues. If there were no mobilization, I don't think this issue would have evolved. Or you can find, for example, in the local territories where, do I, uh, where I do work, the migrants' issues is often one which is brought up on the table by, uh, by mobilization. So it's very important that this mobilization, it's not just an issue of numbers, it's also an issue of uh, symbolic power. And uh, in the 19th century, we talked of crowds, of public, of masses, and we were afraid of them. I mean, the people were dangerous, were seen as such. And what was analyzed often in the books was the emotions of these crowds. I mean, it's like these dangerous crowds, and you could feel the emotive anger. And this was frightening the bourgeoisie of the time, and you can find plenty of text about it. Uh, so this is a way of seeing these movements uh, at the time, uh, and finding them frightening too. And it's important to see that this was the first take, uh, because uh, what was first taken into account were emotions. I mean, and that was something that was very much forgotten in the 20th century, because for most people and theorists, uh, theoriciens, theori, uh, theor, uh, people who theorized, I mean, uh, they talked uh, of mobilization such uh, as if they were rational. I mean, you know, they thought that mobilization were a matter of calculus, like people had opportunities to, uh, in terms of, you know, mobilize, mobilizing themselves and would act upon this uh, very rational interest. In the 19th century, it was not the case. Uh, it was very much thought as a matter of emotion, you know, and that's why uh, we feared uh, these local crowds, because we feared this surge of emotion. If you remember, I mean, this is just a, a small digression, but uh, emotion were related to women. I mean, men were rational and women were emotional, and this was a big split somehow, and emotion were something to be feared. I mean, we didn't know what to make of it. Rationality, that's something we could tackle with. Uh, just a slide about that. Patrick Guedes is, uh, he was a biologist at first and then he came uh, to be, uh, to work on civic transformation. He very much rationalized and worked on uh, local mobilization and his book uh, of uh, 1915 is a major one. I mean, very, very good book. Uh, still now very much in use uh, among urbanism and also uh, amongst uh, the people of the degrowth movement. I mean, if you've worked on degrowth move, on the degrowth, maybe you have heard of this guy because he was a major figure, Scottish biologist, uh, a very original figure. Uh, and this was uh, uh, what uh, he, 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 he developed all the, he was one of the first for the bio, uh, did you, did, have you ever heard of bioregionalism? No? It means that uh, when you talk of the cooperative movement, when you talk of all this movement, it should grow according to the geographical basin. I mean, uh, maybe you have heard of, of that. It's very developed in Italy, for example, uh, and it's uh, getting more and more developed uh, by even economists, because I, I have one, uh, I, have, uh, to, I am part of the jury of uh, an economist uh, uh, next week and he's talking about commons and how commons are very much related to this movement which 
the bio-regionalisme, which was introduced for the first time in the beginning of the, of the 20th century, 1915. So, uh, and what is important with that, that this guy didn't have uh, any uh, bad preconception uh, regarding the people he was uh, supposed to manage. I mean, this local mobilization, these local groups, he figured that uh, he could work with them and that would be the new uh, era of the city, you know. And uh, that's very important, especially in Scotland. So that's very important. Oh, he was a pioneer for all kinds of, uh, of thoughts. So this you should look at, because we need economists in this field, in bioregionalism, to see how uh, nature somehow and society can work together in a circular economy at this level. It's a question of scale, once again. So this is uh, some of the scheme, he, he, he talked about the paleo order, and he was trying to get this figure, very big figure, and he was very much inspired also by, uh, by anarchist figure, uh, Scottish anarchist figure this time, not Russian or not French. So, and... Uh, uh, also, uh, 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 what is interesting is this guy, he didn't specialize. I mean, it's not like now that you have to be very specialized. And when you're someone like me, you know, I am a geographer, but not so much anymore. I am not a philosopher, even though I can talk of philosophy and such and such. Uh, I, I talk of women, but uh, women as a, uh, so, uh, should they be the topic of a geographical thinker and such and such. You find yourself devalorized because you're just pretending to get out of the ghetto, uh, the, 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 uh, the intellectual ghetto they, uh, that have been created for you. Because, well, that's something... Uh, uh, so uh, it was one of the first who talked of the 19th century of the, as a paleo-technical prison dominated by carboniferous capitalism. So you could, you know, even in his thought, you could find some, uh, some uh, prefiguration of the Anthropocene era or Capitalocene. Another school which was kind of important, uh, if you look at ordinary uh, mobilization, is the Chicago School. Alors, why is it important? It was a school which was uh, created in the 1925 with the arrival of European migrants uh, in America, especially in Chicago. Uh, there were plenty of uh, 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 strong industrialization running on and a lot of migrants arriving, and it's because they analyzed the link in between the, the space and the creation of the urban spaces as different spaces and neighborhood with the movements of this local mobilization, which were all from different uh, ethnic origins. So there was like this creation of this enormous migrant cities with a lot of different mobilization in space, in different spaces. And uh, these guys at the time, they represented the different of, uh, environment of the city as natural areas. For them, there was this kind of, of adequation, adequation in between the spaces and the communities. It's very strong in American culture. Nowadays, if you go, uh, if you analyze some local territory and you look at mobilization and how people do engage in stewardship, for example, you find that there is this idea of a local community linked to its spaces and uh, uh, on, engaging in, in its protection. It's very American. It's not so French. 
Yes? I wonder do you have potential uh, risks in uh, talking in making links between nature and some uh, society uh, social aspects like these in kind of naturalizing some social aspects and seeing like I don't know saying that they are natural and therefore you know the, that we can act upon them and that it's just as it is. Yeah, yeah, I see very well what you mean because it is. Uh, 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 I always found that this argument was a way to 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 devalue, uh, devaluize uh, the way these people could take care of the environment, uh, because in fact, what is important in this relationship is how people do feel authorized to act upon the environment in the name of. Politics. I mean, and what we should look at is not how they uh, how they related to this environment, but how do they engage in the name of it, which is quite different, I think. So uh, it is an issue. Uh, so. This is one of these guys of the Chicago School. I think you have had time to look at that. We'll go further. And he talked about uh, collective behavior. Uh, this is a, a new way of seeing collective mobilization. Uh, uh, and he thought at the time that the behavior of people was very much a reflection of how they were uh, inscribed in, sp in different spaces. I mean, there was this natural relation, as you talked. I mean, and this was very much naturalized. And uh, what is interesting in this school of thought is they took after the ecology of plants, of Clemens. Clemens was a well-known ecologist. You know, the term ecology was coined for the first time by uh, Ekel in the 1850s, something like that. Uh, and soon after, he coined the term ecology as a relationship between organism and spaces. I mean, it was taken very much by uh, ecology, uh, people who worked on the ecology of plants. And uh, you know what is noticeable in the ecology of plants? Nobody? the succession. I mean, one, you can find first, for example, lichens and moss. Then you find another kind of plant, then another kind, then this is the succession. And you can analyze that at all uh, scales. And it was the first, uh, the first thing this guy did uh, in Chicago. They thought that migrants were like plants, you know, coming. And first came, I don't know, the Jewish, then came the Russians, and came, and it was quite a succession. And you could use the same grid of analysis for plants and for migrants. And this, were, this is why it was uh, uh, thought as an urban ecology, this, uh, this uh, grid of analysis. So if you go to the 20th century, uh, as I told you, uh, often people didn't talk anymore. Uh, before the 1970s, people didn't talk anymore of culture. I mean, like uh, if you talk of ethnic mobilization, you talk of culture. Uh, at this time, uh, all literature on mobilization was very much marked by rationalism uh, issues. So. In, um, in, the, in, the, in the writings of many thinkers, you could find description of this mobilization as social organization which were uh, very aware of the environment and of all opportunities emerging from this environment. I mean, it was, and nobody thought anymore about culture. Uh, and that was very much forgotten in between, I would say, uh, uh, after war, in between, uh, after Second World War and uh, the 70s. 
something like that. I mean, it was uh, discovery even in geography of this idea of rationality. And afterwards, there was a new social movement, and this, this NSM, as we call that new social movement, NMS in French. Uh, uh, I mean, they comprised different kinds of mobilization, feminism, uh, ecologism, uh, and these were the two uh, which were major trends at the time. And for many thinkers of the time, of the 70s, these were seen as cultural mobilization. This was a mistake, a big mistake uh, we can apprehend nowadays. But at the time, they thought that fighting for ecology was fighting for quality of life, and it had no major stake. I mean, at the time, it was just a question of quality of life. Yeah, you like a green garden, this is a cultural issue. It's not a concrete material issue, you know, and this was very much forgotten. And the same for feminism. It was seen as a very much a symbolic uh, cultural issue. So, uh, and so that's what some, I think I have it on the next slide, maybe, uh, no. Uh, so this was what a, a, a major thinker of the time, I can't remember his name, co called the post-materialist uh, mobilization, you know, this, uh, because mobilization of the 20th century, it was salary, it was, you know, uh, things that were very important for the life of workers and such, but this mobilization were seen as, you know, uh, the spoiled, the, 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 the product of spoiled children of a very, very spoiled society of the northern country. I mean, uh, and nowadays you can see how wrong this way of seeing this mobilization at the time were. But at the time, this was how they were seen, not crucial issues. It's also why the communist for example, you take Ivry sur Seine, which was, uh, as I told you, com a communist uh, uh, small city, uh, 60,000 people nowadays. Uh, I mean, this issue of feminism and ecologism, it's just since the 2020 they're taken into account. You know, it's very recent because uh, the communists were very much attached to pro production, productivist issues. And so we're not taking into account these cultural issues. So, uh, okay, you have different, you know, way of uh, talking of this mobilization, the rational choice theory, uh, where the individual seeks to maximize personal utility through collectives, they use their engagement as a, a way to maximize their own profits. I mean, all this way of seeing mobilization, you can find it in economy also. I mean, uh, in the big way, in the big uh, economist uh, theory. Uh, also, the resource mobilization theory, the RMT, where you, people do uh, seek uh, for opportunities outside in their environment. So the environment in itself is not considered as such. I mean, it has no value except in a utilitarian way. So it's like a, a very, very uh, uh, reductive uh, way of seeing that. So, new social movement theory, identity, culture, and uh, these are, you know, different ways to, t uh, to tag uh, this different theory, s looking at this mobilization. You will have this in the hour. I mean, uh, you don't need to rush uh, taking notes. I, I will give it to you. So, okay, uh, collective mobilization, interest, motivation, values, a lot of people are looking at that, once again, 
especially in the field of sociology. I mean, that's something you lo you're looking at. Uh, and you look at how uh, these mobilizations are controlled and what they do control themselves and what kind of resources and how they do organize themselves and what kind of external conditions do play a role upon them. So, so as I told you, I mean, this new way of seeing mobilization was very much aligned with the counterculture of uh, post-68, 1968. If you, uh, I worked in Russia uh, many times, I mean, uh, on mobilization before now, obviously. Uh, in between 2000 and uh, last time I went there was in 2013 or 15, I, I, I was in Tartastan, Tatarstan, in Kazan. And uh, you can find many traces in the archives of the role of 68 in mobili on mobilization in Russia during, during the Soviet time. Don't, I mean, this 68 rupture had an impact everywhere in the world on how people did engage with certain issues. I mean, that's something you have to take uh, uh, into account. Okay. Uh, so, uh, in the 80s, uh, 70s, 80s, uh, you can find different kind of people arriving on this scene of the ecological movements. First, uh, if you look at the scientific, they're very much talking about what we talked with uh, Luc Abadi the other day. This is a rival of systemic reading of ecological processes. This kind of schema, you know, where you find numbers and how energy is uh, a flux in between these different elements of the environment. And if you look at mobilization, there are two kinds, you could say, that arrive. There are the great mobilization. I mean, what I call, the, for example, you find people who want another type of lifestyle and who go back to the countryside, or go back to the mountains and engage with uh, uh, goats and goat's milk, for example, and just try to change their, their ways of living. But there are also people who are just more concerned with the protection of nature. They do not engage uh, with uh, the change of society. Uh, they're not political at all. They just engage with what we call the protection of nature. And that's something these guys or these movements were, t uh, were tagged as being environmentalist and the others were more tagged as being ecologist. I mean, there, there's something of, of, of a divide between these different kinds of mobilization. Uh, okay, you, you, I have already presented this slide, so I don't know why these slides are here. Well, it's just to describe the... Then you have the 90s uh, and this sustainable movement growing. Uh, what happened at the time is uh, not only, as he said, a worldwide uh, repercussion, it was a moment for uh, uh, the rise of plenty of mobilization in the territories. Uh, did you... Uh, have you ever heard of the Sustainable uh, Cities Alliance? Yeah? yeah? So it was the first time it was signed up was at this moment, uh, in 92, uh, at the Rio Summit. And all cities and uh, different territories signed up with collective mobilization at local scales, plenty of engagement, uh, which were not so much... Uh, uh, accomplished, but uh, whatever. Uh, so, okay, so this is uh, what my colleague uh, teach about is this moment of 92, which was seen as a turning point uh, in terms of this uh, history of the political ecology, was also a turning po point in terms of seeing how mobilization 
were engaging with policy making. I mean, it was at first environmental policy and sustainable development policies were a way to work with civil society. I mean, it was participative policies. Not so much nowadays, but at the time it was above all participative policies. So that's, uh, uh, that's something, and it, it, it reinforced, uh, even in France, the decentralization and ways of looking how, at how to work with this all kind of people. Okay, then 2000, and we'll go to the emergence of global ecological movements. And uh, like uh, from the 70s on, you know, there are this big mobilization, as I told you, they were mainly male at the start, I mean, with very big figures uh, and very exclusive. When I say male, I also say white. I mean, they were mainly white male uh, mobilization. At the local level, you could see that uh, there were many alliances. Uh, in 2007, for example, I mean, the, the French uh, president did, on, did create this uh, Grenelle de l'Environnement, which was a moment of political alliance between local mobilization and the government to work and, uh, 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 and co-construct co uh, a national uh, policy of the environment. Uh, and so this is something where you could, I mean, many activists were very much against that because they say it diluted the figure of the political activist and just uh, uh, highlighted this figure of expert activist. And it's true at, that at the time and now in different territories, you can see that mobilization are becoming more and more expert which is needed on territories. And that's kind of difficult because uh, some people do say, okay, we do become expert and we engaging with all these issues of waste management, pollution management, biodiversity, uh, uh, alimentation management, but we're not paid for it. So what does it mean? I mean, uh, we're still receiving a very small budget for all we're doing. Uh, does it, uh, it, well, it's what we could call neoliberalism acting on the field, you know, just disengaging the state, disengaging itself, and giving more and more uh, missions to this local mobilization. Okay, Grenelle de l'Environnement. Uh, so it's what, uh, it closes, it's what one of my colleagues say, it closes this period of integration of collective actors uh, in techno-scientific procedures, you know. Uh, but still there was a certain convergence of uh, different mobilization on the field. Okay. But on the other side, on the other hand, you can find a radicalization of militant alternative. I mean, you know, the, the world of mobilization is not one world. It's many worlds and many ways of seeing this way of acting in the, uh, in the favor of the environment. So you can find the, the raising, the rise of radical militant alternative like uh, civil disobedience, squatting, uh, anti-advertising. In my book, I talk about this kind of uh, mobilization. Anti-specist, I remember, because I was working very much on animals issue of meeting with many anti-specist, you know. Uh, people didn't want to wear shoes or didn't want to, you know, uh, engage with a certain number of uh, uh, tradition. Uh, and also, uh, I would say, the re-legitimization of certain anarchist movements, you know, or alternative modes of living. 
For example, if you take the book of James Scott, do you know James C. Scott? Or Graeber, David Graeber? Yeah, more. You sh should read James C. Scott. He is an anarchist, anthropologist, thinker. He is a major one, and he has worked uh, on the rise of the state, especially in Southeast uh, Asia. Uh, but it's very interesting how Graeber is very interesting too. Not only his debt uh, book, but also uh, his new book, his last book, obviously, because uh, he died since then. So, uh, okay. Yes? Zoomania? Uh, zo, uh, zo zoomania? Zo is that said? Uh, this is, I mean, he has written uh, books which are more uh, light, lighter to read. I mean, uh, more, more, uh, le uh, 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 small number of pages. This one is quite big, but I find it uh, uh, more interesting, in fact. And because he details the role of geography once again in uh, the fleeing of state. For example, he says that people at the time could flee in mountains the, the, this, uh, um, uh, this, uh, con uh, this building of state uh, because nobody had the way to, 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 uh, to grasp this population who were fleeing. I mean, so the role of geography in terms of the uh, uh, construction of state was a major one. Uh, it's interesting to see how it plays. Okay. Uh, so I told you about that, how more and more uh, collective mobilization are created. And these are the registered one in France. Some of them are not registered. And from one country to the other, we don't have the same way to calculate this mobilization. This is a major flow because if you want to analyze what, are, what is the economic, political contribution of this collective mobilization, you need to have the same way to, to, to assess what they do bring on the table. But we do not have, even at the French scale, it's very difficult to estimate their weight in local territories in terms of policy making, in terms of, you know, uh, it's the same for women. I mean, uh, if you talk about catastrophe, uh, we do not have the data. I mean, the data uh, to see how much women and uh, local mobilization of women have contributed to the post-catastrophe uh, relief. We don't have uh, split data in between men and women. You know, we just have uh, non-gendered uh, uh, non non data. So first we need to have the data if we want to estimate the, 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 the importance of all that. So other movements is just uh, also, something you have uh, to see, it's uh, redirection between towards uh, direct action. I mean, don't protest, but do act. I mean, don't say we need more gardens, but just create your garden. And so this kind of mobilization was very much uh, done after artists and other guys like that. And, but it was the environmental movement creation, you could say, this way of protesting, this way of occupying different spaces, in, uh, especially in cities or the roads. Uh, so, action direct. For example, these guys, they do occupy a parking place, I mean, uh, with greens. Uh, So this, I told you, very uh, varied uh, repertoire of action, including space occupations, which is a very great way to, to, to mobilize. Uh, nowadays, we have great mobilization in France, huh, which I call uh, les soulèvements de la terre. I don't know how many have heard of that. We're protesting against dams, which are created to... to, to, to to reserve water, to take water, to, to maintain water in great basin in order to, 
to have uh, to pursue this uh, very big agriculture. So we're protesting against it. Uh, one thing you have to see also is uh, the new trend since I would say like 10 years or so of how mobilization are taking the road of legal and judicial struggles. You know, it's not only a person of the civil society because for example, you have local uh, players or local actors like Mayas, for example, who are uh, protesting against the state or against Shell or against Total or against... Uh, and so they taking legal, uh, the legal route in order for to, to protest. So this legal route uh, and the state of France was... Uh, was, uh, I mean, he was uh, treated as guilty many times. Uh, long routes, difficult one, you need expertise. Uh, even if you're at a local scale, I mean, for example, the Canadian mobilization do know a lot about that because they're very much professional about it. So they have lawyers, they have all these kind of people behind them. So you need to be well organized, and that's what I call political culture. You need to know against whom you're fighting and how much you can evade or you can uh, uh, the repercu repercussion. Uh, in France, we had l'affaire du siècle. Did you hear about that, l'affaire du siècle? I mean, that was a big, big uh, mobilization. Perhaps some of you could, uh, could uh, talk about that if you, if you know about it. I mean, it's, uh, so let me see, because it's like we can, okay, so we're not going, these are different images, COP21, the 10 uh, organizations such as ATTACK, uh, other one uh, who were part of it, WWF, and uh, all this organization, Oxfam, uh, which is a very, very old one, uh, Greenpeace, and uh, Les Amis de la Terre, Friends of the Earth, uh, Free50.org is a very well-known, very active organization. And some of them, this one, for example, France Nature Environnement, is a mobilization which was, uh, its birth is in 68, around 68, and it's a gathering of many local mobilization. It's a network of network. Uh, and now it is a very big organization for nature protection. So, and very well organized. Uh, so different mobilization, uh, different ways of protesting. Uh, also, uh, what you could see is that, uh, that uh, these people do know best now how to organize themselves. I mean, uh, and we're working on different mobilization in uh, the metropolitan areas. And some people do use a lot of uh, internet to organize themselves. I mean, it's, a, it's also something I forgot to say, that internet modified the way to organize. Especially if you talk of interscalar organization. I mean, uh, it's, uh, and for example, I was talking about this mobilization about free cats in cities. These ladies of, were among the first to use the internet to connect with free cats France in other cities of Europe. I mean, that was very interesting to see how they use these new means in order to organize themselves. So do you know this map? I guess you know it. Who knows it? Most of you, not all of you. The Environmental Justice Atlas. Uh, it's uh, the result of uh, research action uh, which was, uh, uh, which was uh, realized by uh, Juan Martinez Allier, you might know of, is a major academic in the field of environmental justice. He brought up the issue of 
l'écologie des pauvres, l'écologisme des pauvres pour écologisme. So that's something important. And this map reflects, and you can go on the site, it's very interesting. So it reflects different mobilization. Uh, this is the theme of the mobilization, the color, I mean. And then you have on the right uh, a detailed uh, description of this mobilization and how they do engage with different things and how uh, it's something you should look at. It's interesting as such. I mean, there were many papers uh, written after this. You could do research if you want about that. I mean, I think it could be interesting. What? Can everyone just add uh, a like, thing? Oh. Like it's, it's about different places and different movements. But yeah. is everyone... Is All over the world. Yeah, is everyone able to write an article about you something? Need, you, need, you need, I guess, to be registered because they don't want... I mean, it's a touchy subject, uh, as you might know. I mean, uh, so you need to be... Uh, I guess you can contact them and see how you can write something on the mobilization, uh, but you need to contact them because uh, that's a very touchy subject, as you can... Uh, Do you know if, if it's just written by one person? Or no, it's like written by plenty, by plenty, uh, 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 very large no, group like of people. One article. Is the one article just written by one person or is this one article like also fact-checked and stuff like that by others? Uh, I think that uh, uh, each article is a result of a research of a group of people in different places. For me, I, I could write something if I wanted on different, you know, but I don't, I don't know how much it is peer reviewed, if that's your question. Uh, you should ask them. That's a good question, Angela. At least in Uruguay, it's not up to date. What? Because it's showing some conflicts that are resolved. Yeah, it may be, because they keep uh, the history of it. It was open for the first time, and there are new maps since then. I mean, uh, for example, in Paris, this collective movement have created a map which is used by the municipality of Paris as a tourist thing. So they, this is very interesting in terms of reappropriation. This local mobilization tried to create this map of local contribution to the environmental cause by different people, you know, some who protected bees, others who did whatever. And this is a way for the municipality to say, you see, I do plenty of things for the environment. I mean, it's like, you know, there is this um, reappropriation of all these movements. But this map was first open, I, I, I can't remember the dates, but you, I guess there is a history of the, uh, perhaps uh, 2017 or something, no? Mm. So, something like that. This is another kind of map, French one, with le zone à défendre, les ZAD. You have, some of you have heard about the ZAD uh, of Notre Dame des Landes, which was very much against one airport. And this map was published. Uh, this were different ZAD, meaning zone to be defended, uh, where people, mobilization, do regroup and try to defend a cause, a place, mostly. Uh, and this map is an old one, so I, I mean, I don't, not very old, 2019, maybe, something like that. Yeah, 19, I think. But it may be obsolete already. Uh, but what is interesting is that this map was published in a journal which is dedicated to local uh, builders, uh, meaning once again, Le Moniteur. It is a journal which is very much used by Bouig and by other uh, big corporate to know how, how they could confront such issues at the local level. So you see maps, 
I mean, they use by both sides in different ways. Uh, so I will finish, I mean, it's like, uh, uh, I will send it to you, you can send me question, uh, because it's 23. Uh, as I told you, some, you know, interesting, you can see interesting things on the field, doing field work, uh, on the joining between social justice movement, environmental justice movement, climate justice movement. Uh, uh, and how people do engage with their way of being attached to their places. I mean, you have to take into account feelings and aesthetics. Uh, that's what I uh, try to, to tell you at the start. Um, so, because it's much too long, so you will find it, because I'm a specialist of, uh, you know. Okay, let's go in discussion, we'll see afterwards. This is, a, you, you will see on the slideshow, uh, there is uh, an analysis of how in France this uh, movement of mobilization was, had, had participated to the, uh, urbanism and the way to produce uh, this modern city of nowadays. 